Good evening, good evening, good evening. This is Pastor T welcoming you to our Word and Worship Celebration. Thank you so much for joining us for our Word and Worship Celebration. Come on in, come on in. Thank you so much for joining us for our Word and Worship Celebration. Listen, if you're joining us from somewhere around the Gainesville region, welcome. If you're joining us from somewhere around the state of Florida, outside the state of Florida, somewhere else in the United States, or maybe you're joining us from somewhere around the globe, do know that we have prayed for, planned for, and prepared for the opportunity to worship God together using this platform, and we're praising God that he has given us this chance uh, to worship him. Please come in and uh, put a comment in the comment section to let us know that you're here. If you're joining us from somewhere outside the Gainesville region, let us know what city and state you're joining us from, uh, and then uh, hit a thumbs up, and then also do this, do this. Share this with someone tonight so that they can learn uh, the word of God and, and take a deep dive into studying the word of God, uh, because I believe there is uh, power and there's impact and there's benefit to our lives in studying the Word of God. Uh, let's look to the Lord in prayer and then we'll transition into uh, the lesson for this evening. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. The whole earth is full of thy glory. Father, we come tonight saying thank you because of your grace, your mercy, and your love. We pray that you would forgive us of our sins, our faults, and our failures. Create within us clean hearts, O God, and renew right spirits within us. We pray as we prepare to open the word that you would open our minds and help us to understand, soften our hearts and help us to spiritually receive. And we will give your name thanks, praise, honor and glory until the coming of our Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. And uh, please, please thank you uh, for liking and, and subscribing on whatever platform you're on and sharing with someone. Uh, tonight we're continuing our uh, series of lessons uh, regarding the nature of God, regarding the nature of God. If you want to worship God better, uh, my position is you, you have to know God better. If you want to worship God better, then you should know God better. If you want to worship God better, praise him better, worship him better, uh, then you have to know him better. And the way he has facilitated us, uh, one of the ways he has facilitated for us to know him and to know him clearly and intimately is through his divine and holy word, through the holy word of God that was written by 40 different writers over the span of 1500 years as they were inspired and moved by the pneuma, the spirit of God as God breathed on them and gave them the ability to share the mind of God and the heart of God in text form. And so we have it and God has revealed himself unto us through his holy word. And so we've been teaching through a series of lessons of understanding God and knowing God. Uh, we have been looking at uh, the eight natural attributes of God. So God has two different types of attributes, two different types of attributes. God has what you call natural attributes, natural attributes. God has natural attributes and he has, secondly, moral attributes, moral attributes, moral attributes. His natural attributes are what we call non-communicable uh, attributes. These are uh, attributes that are only found in God, that they are the essence of who God is, the essence of who God is. His incommunicable attributes are uh, only solely given to him and to the Godhead. Now, those are eight natural attributes, and then he has what we call 12 moral attributes, 12 moral attributes. And these are what are called communicable attributes, communicable. That means they can co be communicated or conferred. They, we can emulate them, we can imitate them, but God is them. Uh, some of the natural attributes that we have been looking at uh, relate to God's omniscience. God knows everything. Only God can claim that, and only God can even symbol, uh, uh, give a semblance of that. God is uh, omnipotent. God is omnipotent. That mean he, means he has all authority and he has all ability. God has all authority and all ability. He is omnipotent. And then God is omnipresent. He is omnipresent. And certainly that one uh, belongs only to God, even though many of us wish we could be in two or three places at the same time. Only God can be everywhere at the same time. And he's in all time uh, or he is uh, present in all time at all times. So time is found in God. And so God is present uh, in all parts of time, time in memorial, time 
in the contemporary and time in the future eternity. God is present in it all. And so those are natural attributes. Those are some of his natural attributes that we've talked about. But then there are 12 moral attributes and we'll cover those uh, at another time. We'll cover those 12 moral attributes, but let me just give you a glimpse of some of those. Righteous, God is righteous. Man acts righteously, but God is righteous. That means everything he does has the right motivation and the right intent. God is love, God is love. Man shows love and we love ye one another, but God is love. It's the very essence of who he is. Uh, God is holy, God is holy. There is no variableness in him and there is no opportunity of, of uh, unholiness and he is pure and without spot or without blemish. You and I try to act holy. We try to live holy. We try to uh, walk in holiness, but God is holy, you see? So those are moral attributes that we try to em emulate, but they are the essence of who God is. And so tonight we're going to we're going to finish up and we're going to look at the last few of the natural attributes. We're going to look at the last few of the natural attributes uh, and uh, we will uncover some more truths about the greatness and glory of God. As a quick review, as a quick review, we've talked about God in his unity, God in his unity. He is the one true living God. They are not multiple gods. They are not different deities that we should worship. Now, you can make a God out of anything, but it's a little g God, but there's only one true and living God. Well, what do you mean, Pastor? Well, some people make their God material. Some people make God their material. Material. Yeah, their, their God is material. Material possessions, things that they can tangibly have and hold and buy. That's some people's God, and they'll do anything to get money and do anything to get materialism. That's their God. Materialism is their God. Then there are some people that are, uh, they made themselves little gods. The narcissist and self-centered people, they are the most important person in their own universe. Well, that's a self-centered person that has made himself or herself God. And we've all experienced people like that. They don't care about anything or anyone else but themselves. Well, that person has made themselves out to be a little God. Then there are some people that make pleasure God, make pleasure God, meaning uh, the things uh, uh, and the pleasures of this world are the most important things to them. They want to eat, eat drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die, the Epicurean uh, uh, phrase. And so they, they just want to enjoy life, and that's their God. But there's only one true and one living God, and he is, <clears throat> he is uniformed in his being, so the unity of God. Then we talked about the Trinity, the Trinity of God. God affirms that there is only one God who eternally exists, but he has three distinct persons that, uh, that we, we uh, uh, are see in the scriptures. God the Father, who is spirit, God the Son, who took on human flesh and dwelled among us, and God the Holy Spirit that lives and dwells on the inside of the believer, the Trinity of God. God is one God that manifests himself in, in, and represents himself in three different personalities uh, that we have interaction with. Then uh, we learned about the self-existence of God. He doesn't need anybody to help him be God. Whether you accept him as God or I reject him as God, it does not matter. He is still God and he doesn't need anyone to affirm him, lift him, or uh, uh, propagate him. He is God by himself. <clears throat> And then uh, we talked again about the omniscience of God. That means God knows everything. Uh, he, is, he has all knowledge and has it all perfectly. He's never learned anything, nor has he, has he ever forgotten anything. Then there's the omnipresence of God. He's everywhere at the same time. And then the omnipotent, omnipotence of God, omnipotence. God has all power and all authority. So tonight uh, we want to look at uh, two uh, more attributes of God that I think will be helpful to us. I love the Lord Jesus. I love his word. Join me in his word in Psalm number 90. Psalm number 90. Psalm number 90. Psalm number 90 says, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting, to everlasting, thou art 
God. Thou turn man to destruction and says, return ye children of men for a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past and as a watch in the night. Thou carest them away as with a flood. They are as asleep in the morning. They are like grass which grows up. In the morning it flourishes and, and grows up, and in the evening it is cut down and wherewith. For we are consumed by thine anger, and by thy wrath we are troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are but threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, Yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knows the power of thine anger, even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. Thank God for his holy word. All right. The first uh, or the next natural attribute of God that we want to look at is his eternality. Eternality. And that's just a big word uh, that simply means God is eternal. God is eternal. We worship God. We glorify him. We praise him because he is eternal. As Moses describes it here, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. The doctrine of eternality of God proclaims that God is without beginning and end, transcending the confines of time and temporal existence. So often people will ask the question, well, who is God's mother and who is God's father? If God created everything, the question is raised, well, who created God? Well, friend, that argument or that question has no basis or merit because it suggests that the God who made time has to be found in a point in time and that the God who is creator had to be created by something or someone. And that is just a fallacy. So in Genesis chapter number one, Genesis chapter number one, verse number one, Moses starts off with a very strong phrase as it has been downloaded to him from God. And he makes a very assumptive statement, a declarative statement upon the truth upon which all of our understanding of God uh, it begins to develop. He says this. In the beginning, God created. So watch this. Beginning was here, but God had to be somewhere over here before the beginning because he's the one that's affecting beginning. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What Moses declares there is that before anything was, God was. And before anything came into being, God was already being. And so what he assumes is, is that, number one, we, he establishes the fact there's only one true God. <clears throat> he assumes that his reader and his hearer and his listener has already settled it in their heart and mind about who God is. Because he doesn't introduce God in any any uh, narrative way. He doesn't say that the God who is before the cosmos, the God who he, he just simply says in the beginning. God created heavens and earth. So that means that God was found outside of time and that time had to show up in God. All right. So so he, he transcends temporal and uh, finite existence because he is an infinite and eternal God. He exists perpetually, having neither a starting port point nor conclusion, making him the alpha and the omega. That's the first letter of the Greek alphabet and the last letter of the alphabet before anything was God, God is. And and when all things have ceased to be, God still is. He still exists. He he bookends all of existence. He bookends all of creation. There was never a time when God was not. There shall never be a time when God is not. And guess what? You and I can thank him for that. And we worship him. Because he's a God that never uh, uh, goes out of being and we can depend on him and count on him throughout all of time. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. This belief underscores God's unfathomable nature and his sovereignty over time and creation. 
The scriptural foundations for this doctrine include Psalm 90, verse 2, that we have read, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. When you go out and look in the, uh, when you go to the, to, to the west coast and, and you look at the mountains, or when you go up the eastern seaboard and, and you go and look at the mountains, oh, it's, it's something to behold. And you see that those mountains have presided and been there for thousands of years. Well, even before those mountains were hewed out and, uh, and, and, and carved out, God already existed. And he will exist even after the mountains have crumbled into the sea. Revelation chapter 1 verse 8 says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, says the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. This affirms God's eternal existence in our theology, in our thinking and in our doctrinal theology, in our teaching of what we believe. God stretches through time and God exists beyond past, present and future. Let me give you another scriptural example that undergirds this. Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 27. Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 27. Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 27. This is what God says about himself. The eternal God is thy refuge and un underneath are the everlasting arms and he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee and shall say, destroy them. He is the eternal God that is our refuge. You know what uh, Moses is describing about God? He says, now I know you're living in uncertain times. I know you are enduring uncertain challenges and I know you have a certain enemy. He says, but be clear about this. You have assurance in the fact that you have a God that has never gone out of business and never shall go out of business. He is the eternal God and that God that you can depend upon, that God that you can count on is our refuge. You know what a refuge is? It's a place where you can hide. It's a place uh, where you can find uh, protection. It's a place where you can find peace and solace. Uh, we live in nice homes today uh, that are built. Uh, many of them are now, if they've been built in the last uh, 30 years, have been built according to a higher building code and building standard. The reason for which is because uh, in the 1990s, a terrible hurricane named Hurricane Andrew came through and obliterated uh, South Florida. Uh, when Hurricane Andrew came through, it was uh, the highest of Category 5 storms, and uh, houses in that area uh, were not built to the modern standards that they are now. And when that hurricane came through with those winds of over 150 miles an hour, the photos and the videos from the aftermath looks like a nuclear bomb went off and destroyed everything there. And after that, they, uh, the state of Florida implemented new building codes that everything had to have certain hurricane force rating. The windows, the doors, the structure of the house had to have a higher rating to be able to withstand uh, greater winds and impacts. But even with that, even now, tornado can come and a strong enough hurricane can come and still rip the roof off of your house. It may take a little bit more to do it, but it can still happen. But this is what Moses teaches us about God. And that is the house you live in may be destroyed, but the God you have refuge in will never be destroyed. Isn't that good news? And so we can trust and depend upon God. He stretches through time and he is eternal. But then not only that, he's steadfast through the ages and he remains the same across the eons. God is steadfast. Glory to God uh, through the ages. And he remains the same across the eons of eternity. This is what Malachi 3 and verse 6, Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 says, uh, God says about himself, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob uh, are not consumed. I am the Lord, and I change not. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8 says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, and today and forevermore. Now, we live in a world of constant and consistent change. 
As a matter of fact, everything around us uh, changes, everything in us changes, everything about us changes with the passing of each day. Many people claim that they do not like change and, and I can kind of understand their position, uh, but the reality is change is a reality of life and you don't live in this world without, without having to deal with change. Everything about our world changes and changes on a constant basis changes on a constant basis. Uh, for those that don't like change, uh, listen, uh, when you stop changing, then you are dying. Uh, the reality is, if you were to go and get a picture of yourself from just 10 years ago, just grab a picture from 10 years ago and hold it up next to yourself and stand in the mirror, you'll see that there's been some changes. There's been some changes. Uh, if you look out on the landscape of the earth, they have now these new satellite images that show how the earth has changed and how neighborhoods change and how different places change over time. Change is a part of our world, but here's one thing I'm glad about. Uh, uh, here's another thing, let me, let me say this. People's beliefs change and people's mindsets change. Uh, I've been startled to see over the last uh, uh, 10 years or, or, or 15 years, the changes in people's religious uh, philosophies and their religious attitudes and their attitudes towards God and towards faith and towards the Bible and, and all of these things. It's been amazing to see how p less and less people believe in God, less and less people worship God, less and less people believe in going to church. All of that is changing. But here's what Hebrews tells us about Jesus. He's the same yesterday and today and forever. That means everything else will change, but I thank God the Lord never changes. And aren't you glad about that? People will change on you, but the Lord never will. Times will change on you, but the Lord will never will. Your circumstances will change, but the Lord never will. He changes not and he sustains eternity. He himself is the source of eternal life. If you're going to have eternal life, it has to come from the life giver and the life bringer, and that's God. You can't have a temporary, you can't have eternal life using temporary measures. And so often we use temporary measures to try to get to the eternal. But the only way we get to the eternal is we have to go to the one who himself is eternal. First Timothy chapter one, verse 17 says, now unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul says there that we're giving honor unto the king who is not temporary, who is a king that is not subject to military coups, to a king that is not subject to be poisoned like the Caesars of Rome had been, uh, the immediate one that had been uh, poisoned just before uh, Paul writes this letter was Claudius and Nero is now on the throne. Claudius uh, is dead presumably because he's been poisoned by his wife Agrippina who is Nero's mother. But oh, by the way, uh, Claudius was complicit in the death of his nephew Caligula, who had died in similar fashion. So Paul is talking to a group of people and, and Paul rather writing to Timothy in the context of Timothy preaching to people who have who have known Caesars that have come and gone over the years. But here we serve a king who Paul says is eternal and he is immortal. That means he he is not subject to the death of this world. He is invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory, and not for a short time, but forever and ever. In uh, Psalm 102, verse 12, Psalm 102, verse 12, but thou, O Lord, shall endure forever in thy remembrance unto all generations. Listen, what I want you to do is think of a line with no start or end, stretching indefinitely in both directions and that represents God's existence. Just think of a line that, that just goes, uh, starts, and has no beginning, has no end, and just keeps going, going, going. That's the eternality of God. And if that doesn't help you, then just think about taking a teaspoon, going over to the Atlantic Ocean, and dipping the water out of the Atlantic Ocean, teaspoon by teaspoon, teaspoon by teaspoon. When you get to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, you just reach the, the start of eternity. The next one is immutability. God is eternal, but God is also immutable. The Baptist doctrine of immutability of God asserts that God's nature, God's nature, character and promises are unchanging. They are constant throughout eternity. 
despite the shifting sands of time, what? God never changes. Times change, culture changes, human perspective change, changes, but God remains steadfast in his essence, in his attributes, and in his purpose. He is the eternal constant that serves as the bedrock of our faith, trust, and hope. We anchor ourselves in the fact that God never changes. Remember what he said in Malachi chapter three, verse six, for I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Remember Hebrews 13, eight, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is stable in his nature. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 29 says, And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. Uh, God is stable in his nature. God doesn't change in his nature or his promises. Then he's steadfast, his, his promises are steadfast. His words remain the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 17 and 18. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 17 and 18. Wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. Verse 18 says that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have the strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. We don't have to worry. If God said it, it is settled in heaven. His word, uh, uh, David says, is settled in heaven. And we can trust God's word. Why? Because it changes not. As long as I've been living, Psalm 23, been in the book and it's been the same and it's still as glorious. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. That's a promise God made. Uh, Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Listen, people's attitudes towards God may change, but God's love never changes and God's truths never change and God's decrees never change. Psalm uh, 89, verse number four, my covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. So that means God holds fast what he says. Isaiah 40 verse eight said, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Isaiah 40 verse eight, let me read it again. The grass withers and the flower fadeth, but the word of God shall stand forever. And there's a sure consistency. He is the rock that remains unmovable in changing the world. James chapter one, verse 17 says, every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow nor turning. So God is eternal, but also God is immutable. He doesn't change. And we worship him based on that. Listen, a lighthouse stands unchanging, providing guidance and safety, no matter how bad the waters are, no matter how uh, much the wind is howling, no matter how thick the fog of the night may be, one thing remains. That lighthouse stands where it stands and it shines where it shines. So we don't need to worry about the lighthouse. We need to worry about lining ourselves up with the lighthouse, who is God, and he will get us safely to where we need to be. Listen, friend, I pray that you'll uh, put your trust in the Lord. I pray that you'll put your dependence and hope upon him, knowing that he's an eternal God, an immutable God. And I pray that you'll study. And when you see these scriptures that refer to the nature and the, the attributes of God, that you'll key in on them and understand that these are the reasons that we worship God. We don't worship God based on our feelings. We worship God based on the facts of who he is. God bless you. Share your faith with someone. And we look to see you soon. God bless.